and to be in for the Oklahoma Historical Society and the Oklahoma City University and the Oklahoma Christian University, OCC, and the Living Legends. This is Mary B. Roberts, and today I am interviewing Miss Alice Marriott. That's spelled M A R R I O T T. She was born in Illinois, and I'll let her tell you about her parents. Uh, she began her work in Oklahoma as an anthropologist. Uh, she took her degree in anthropology in 1935 from OU. Uh, she was an experienced worker when she began doing the work with the Indians on her anthropology work, probably her degree. Um, she has had many honors as a writer. Um, and as a person, she was um, is now the associate director of the Southwest Research Associates. She has been a consultant in the Indian Council. She's of course Phi Beta Kappa. Um, she was named the uh, given the achievement award from OU in 1952 and she was inducted into the Oklahoma Hall of Fame in 1958. Uh, she was also named uh, the most distinguished woman in Oklahoma by OCU in 1968. The uh, uh, Literary Hall of Fame was made in 1972. As you can see we have a very important person, literarily and otherwise, in for our interview today. We're presently at uh, my apartment at uh, 11022 North May Avenue in Oklahoma City. Miss Marriott has a worker, an assistant, research person who works with her and you will find her name included in many of the writings um, by Miss Marriott. That is Miss Rackland, Miss Carol Rackland. <coughs> Let me name a few of her books that I hope she will comment on. Uh, the ones that I happen to be more familiar with. The Ten Grandmothers I Loved. Uh, Maria of Aldefonso is a story all in itself. The Valley Below, Greener Fields, and then Hell on Horses and Women is uh, a most ingenious writing. Um, I hope that she gives us some of her experiences the two summers that she lived with the Kiowas. Uh, she has a new book coming out this fall and I'll let her give you the title to it and something about what it's going to depict. She's a friend to the Indian and they love her. She has been made a blood brother of one of the tribes and has her Indian name, which I hope she will give for you. I won't attempt it. Um, she's had many experiences that are not yet written and I hope that we get a few of those stories, people that she knows on this tape. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm Mozzie's people. Hey, oh, you got it? Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. Yep, it's okay now. It's good. <coughs> Mozzie's people came from Tidewater, Virginia, and inland with Daniel Boone and the Zanes to Zanesville. Their names were Wood, Guy, D Y E, um, Howard, and Lee. If anybody's really interested in this genealogy business, yeah. and uh, 
those are all very well established names in that part of the country. My parents met in Chicago where they were both working. My father had opened a law practice there and my mother was a secretary, accountant, bookkeeper, what have you, for um, an importing company. So because of his Italian law practice and her interest in imports, they became acquainted. They both lived in Wilmette, Illinois, which is a Chicago suburb, and they used to ride into town is this which one? on a train together to their offices, reciting Alice in Wonderland, and particularly the Jaguar. <laughs> The whole family has always been avid readers, and we're all cursed with total recall. So we can remember all kinds of things like this. And I know when my mother was in a nursing home shortly before she died, they, I had a hurry up call from the head of the place that she had lost her mind. I went tearing across town to see what had happened, and she was sitting up in bed, calmly reciting, was brilliant in the slidey toes, big gyre and jingle in the wave. And I picked it up from there, and we finished it together the way she and my father always had, and she laid that back down, went to sleep quite happily. <laughs> but nobody, of course, heard him. Jabberwock. So there was a great deal of explaining to do about that. <laughs> we came to Oklahoma in 1917. I was seven years old. And we came because my mother and I couldn't stand Chicago winters. They were just too much. Mm -hmm. Her brother, Max Cunningham, was a state highway engineer, and he found a very good position for my father in the highway department. And uh, we lived from that time on in Oklahoma City until I graduated from college at 19 and went to Muskogee as library cataloger there. And I'm not going into my experiences in Muskogee, but I will tell you this, and you can leave it off the map as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> It's just not one of my favorite places. <laughs> but at any rate, this was in the bottom of the Depression. And libraries didn't have money to buy books, or very little money. So we did what we called analyses of books already in the library. Mm -hmm. And I was interested in local history. and. In, in Muskogee, local history is Indian history. So I picked it up from there. Yeah. And after two years, left that job and went to OU, where I was the first woman to take a degree in anthropology in 1935. But the years between 1933 and 35, I spent the summers well, 1936, actually. I spent the summers with the Cuyahogas researching them because there were two major tribes in Oklahoma that had not been studied for over 70 years, the Kiowa and the Arapaho. And I sat by the professor's desk and he had a rack of pipes in front of him and a pack of cigarettes. And I thought, well, if he picks up a pipe, I'll, I'll take the rack home. If he picks up a cigarette, I'll take the pile. <laughs> and he took the, he took the cigarette, and I took the pile. It was not very difficult to get started. The guy was our outgoing, friendly, warm people. And um, I was just learning to drive a car. So I drove it into a ditch in front of the house I was going to visit. <laughs> I had to spend the Thanksgiving weekend there. 
with that kind of a family, and they were wonderful to me, and they still are. I love them all dearly. And uh, it, it, is that the grand thing you want? Yes, this is good. <laughs> uh -huh. Tell us about those summers with the cowboys. Did they well, accept you? Oh, yes. They took it very immediately. Was it through this family through where this you family. were taken in? Yes. They were people who had a very responsible position and uh, were much respected. And they were also church members, which was a good thing. Would you mind naming them? Uh, they were George and Lillian Hunt. 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 Uh -huh. And their daughters. I leave in McElhaney, who lives here in the city now, and Margaret Soodle, T S O O D L E. Good. Who lives <laughs> I at never spell that. Mountain View. And the two young women were about my own age, and we became devoted friends, yeah. and still are. And uh, I had no trouble with acceptance because of that. Wonderful. And as I say, the guy was our outgoing, warm people anyhow. Mm -hmm. And uh, their old grandmother and one of the old uncles were my chief informants with the girls interpreting in turn. And uh, I got a great deal of material that would be utterly unavailable now. Yes, I'm it just It just wouldn't be. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, now, is that in one of your books? In one of your my, stories? Most of this is told in Greener Fields. I had forgotten. I read it somewhere, but I had forgotten which... Well, most of this <coughs> is put in, in Greener Fields. In Greener Fields. I, I knew I had read it, but because I read six or seven of your books, but I couldn't place where it was. <laughs> That's where it and goes. when I called the library, they remembered it too. They all knew you had lived with the Kiowas for a summer or two. And, but none of us could place where it was that you told about it. Well, it, it's in Greener Fields. But uh, one thing that happened was that it was not only depression, it was a drought year. Two, uh, two drought years of 35 and 36. Sure would be. And uh, then came a plague of grasshoppers and devoured Lillian Hunt's garden. Mm -hmm. So we had to just pick up and leave and go over to a place near Hobart to Elk Creek where there was still water. Mm -hmm. The pump had gone dry, everything. Cattle were dying in the fields. It, it was a horrible experience in many ways, and a very wonderful one. Mm -hmm. But you moved with them. I moved with them. Uh -huh. I had the car. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> but we stayed there until the university opened in the fall, and I went back to Norman. And uh, I was planning to go to uh, Radcliffe to take my graduate degrees, but money ran out, so I never did get my train fare. It did that during those depression it did. years. <laughs> it sure did. I know. But I was fortunate because John Collier had just come in as Commissioner of Indian Affairs and established the Indian Arts and Crafts Board. Yeah. And uh, the field representative for this area was referred to me for Plains information, Plains Indian, mm -hmm. and uh, I went to work for the Arts and Crafts Board in February of 1937 and stayed with them until 1942 when we had to abandon all those luxury projects because of the mm -hmm. war. Then I went with the Red Cross. Oh, what was the purpose of that now? That was to encourage and develop crafts of all tribes mm -hmm. and uh, to make, well, Indian crafts, it had all time low, put it bluntly, mm -hmm. and uh, to 
get the people to do the proper kind of work mm -hmm. and to find a market for it. We put on two big exhibitions, one at the San Francisco World's Fair and one at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. I did field collecting and display work and so on for both of those and much of the labeling for the New York show. Um, on that I worked with uh, Eric Douglas of the Denver Art Museum and afterwards we couldn't tell which of us had written what unless it was some particular specimen that one of us had said you do this one. And uh, when the when Congress suspended the Arts and Crafts Board for the duration I went to the Red Cross as a field representative out of the uh, St. Louis office and was given a, a territory, the 26 southwestern Texas counties, which is slightly larger than New England, because I did speak Spanish uh -huh. and they needed someone down there who was bilingual. Well, uh, after a while, Texas and I sort of parted company, <laughs> and I asked for another assignment and uh, went to western New Mexico, and that territory extended from the Colorado line to the Mexican border, and was everything west of the Rio Grande. There were communities there uh, without uh, any electric lights or telephones yeah. or hotels or bathtubs or anything else and it, it, was, it was roughing it but it was fun and I did like the Spanish American people mm -hmm. very much and I made friends with Maria Martinez M-A-R-T-I-N-E-Z mm -hmm. and her husband Julian J-U-L-I-A-N Thank you. And uh, while I was there, Julian died of pneumonia, and uh, I asked Maria if she would work with me if I could find money for a field study. And she said yes, she would. So I came back to Oklahoma and Savoy Lawtonville, I don't have to spell his name, at the uh, University Press um, did raise a fellowship of two thousand dollars. Twenty-five hundred dollars, by God, it was a great big fellowship for those days. For those days. <laughs> and I went back to New Mexico. Well, I wasn't allowed to live in San Alfonso. No white people. But I found a little mud pile of a house. Which I rented for five dollars for friends. <laughs> and another friend, Margaret Schoonover, S C H O O N O V E R, who is better known by her artist's name of Margaret Lefranc, L E F R A N C, came out and joined me. And between us, we put my pie in order and <laughs> we didn't have any plumbing and we had an awful fight with the electric company to get lights in the place and uh, we had to clear out bees under the kitchen floor and a skunk under the bedroom and a few little things like that but <laughs> we, we, we did all right and all this is in the valley but yeah and uh, Margaret set up a studio in one end of the kitchen and I set up a typewriter in the other and we went to work. Mm -hmm. It was a very entertaining sort of community because the, it, the place is called Nambe, N-A-M-B-E. And the population was just about evenly divided between Indians, Spanish Americans, and Anglos, and it was a wonderful place to do a study of three cultures. Mm -hmm. And we 
worked very hard with that, as well as with Miss Maria. Was this the setting of uh, your Maria? No, uh, Maria... It sounds a little bit like it. Well, Maria lived 12 miles away across the valley, okay. and Nam Bay was the interracial community. Mm -hmm. And very interesting. There were about four of our uh, Anglo households that were on very close terms, and uh, we had a cooking contest. Each family entertained one week, night a week. Well, I mean, in successive weeks. And uh, we tried to outcook each other. <laughs> it, 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 really, I, uh, I learned more about gourmet cooking than <laughs> ever before. I did. And uh, we, we had horses, or uh, two of the families had horses. We used to ride up in the badlands behind the houses and uh, hike a good deal. And uh, it, it was a, a very outdoor life mm -hmm. and a lot of fun. But when I had finished Maria, and the valley below, my father became ill, and I came back to Oklahoma City to help my mother. And Margaret's father was ill, and she left New Mexico, and we just broke up the household we had to. Mm -hmm. We collected pottery, particularly, and that's now at Stovall Museum at the University of Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. And uh, except for a few pieces, each of us kept secretly. <laughs> <laughs> we had to, uh, oh, we finally had to hire a U-Haul to get the stuff back here. Mm -hmm. Then uh, I went to work at Stovall as curator of ethnology. What year was this now? Alan? This was uh, 52. 52. And in 55, I met Carol here, and because she had chiggers. <laughs> She'd been up in the blackjacks working with the sack and fox, and they went out to cut poles to build a loom. And um, I counted 78 chiggers on her back. She never let me count the front, but um, she had a at temperature. Oh, she was a sick kid. So when my mother came back from visiting my sister in Des Moines at the end of the summer, and Carol had decided to stay in Oklahoma and go on with her field work. Mother took one look and she said, you cannot let that child go and live in a, a motel with Indians. She's got to stay here. So Carol became the other half of, the, of that household, yeah. or the other third, really. And uh, about that time, the Osage Claims case came up for land compensation. Mm -hmm. And I was asked to research it, and Car Carol researched with me, and we went to Washington with all the other Osages and <laughs> presented our case to the Claims Commission and won you did. Yeah, $25 million. And uh, then we came back and we decided that this research business was pretty good. And we formed Southwest Research Associates. Mm -hmm. And we've been working together ever since. Mm -hmm. Now, since Carol is a demon researcher, she's fierce on dates and things like that, where the river ran and what, what have you. Uh, I leave that to her, and I do the writing, <laughs> and it makes a very good kind of thing. Yeah, it's a good mm -hmm. team. And. Uh, in the years that after the 
Jose's days, which was heard in 56. We uh, formed the Oklahoma Indian Council at the YW. You remember that, I know. Yes. And uh, at one time, we sat down and listed the people we knew by name in Oklahoma City. And there were 2,000 of them. We had our own telephone book, practically. Oh, gosh, I'm not talking about it. <laughs> In 53, after my father had died, I went to Hopi uh, in northern Arizona mm -hmm. and was there for three years doing research with the Hopi. Oh, the Hopi? Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. Well, that's not been written yet. Mm -hmm. And all through this whole life story, there was one woman that held me together, and that was Mary Little Bear Inkanish, I-N-K-A-N-I-S-H. She adopted me as her daughter. She gave me a, my Indian name, Mahiuna. Spell that. M-A-H-I. H. Thank you. <laughs> I had to think about it myself. And uh, I, I became a Cheyenne. I was already, you see, an Ambe, and a Kiowa, and a Hopi, and now I was a Cheyenne. It's a wonder you weren't an Osage. And all the Osages just not bothered. Yeah. <laughs> They, they, they weren't great on adopting anyway. No. And uh, this new book that is coming out now that we've just Yes, read. I want to know about that. Well, then we'll come back to pick up your story then. Well, really the, the, the book is a story because it is Mary Inkinish's life. Oh. And it's called Dance Around the Sun and will be published in September by T.Y. Crow and Company in New York. Hmm. And uh, Carol has done a series of magnificent photographs of the Sundance for it. And we have photographs from the Inkinish family albums. And That's wonderful. it's going to be a very beautiful book, I think. That's good. Now, just tell me some more about this uh, Mary Inkinish. Well, she was a fascinating person. Her father had been a traitor, a white man, and uh, her mother was a sacred woman. In fact, I'm named for her. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mary grew up at Darlington and then went to school at Colony, which is where she met James English, her husband. And they were married, and they had six children, uh, none of them living now that I know of. Mm -hmm. And uh, they went to Anadarko, to the agency, where he was a teamster and in charge of moving materials and mm -hmm. so on. And uh, she began to do beadwork, as she had seen her mother do it. Mm -hmm. And she became, I think, the finest bee worker I have ever known. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were the first Indians I ever heard of who bought a house in Anadarko. And they bought a good big house. And, uh, well, with all those children, after all. Mm -hmm. And uh, they lived in the big house until Jim died in... 48. But they went with me in 39 to San Francisco as demonstrators at the exposition. And I will always remember that trip because we got to the Arizona California line and they wouldn't let you bring any wood in, anything, any plant yeah. life at all. 
and Tim was going to make bows and arrows. So we had <laughs> the whole back of the car full of dogwood and mm -hmm. old dark and such things. Yeah. And we had to take out every stick of it and allow it to be examined so that they would know it was deadwood and not lime. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mary got very much bored with the whole thing and she said, do we have to stay in Arizona all our lives? <laughs> I said, well, eventually we'll get to San Francisco. And we did. And the uh, demonstrators from various tribes were housed um, in Navy barracks on the Arbolina Island mm -hmm. and uh, went back and forth to the Treasure Island where the accusation mm -hmm. was. And she, that, that was where she met Maria and they became great friends. Mm -hmm. And uh, very, very close, very devoted. Mm -hmm. I took Mary back to New Mexico two or three times and she always wanted to stay with Maria. <laughs> she was more at home. Mm -hmm. She died in what, 64. And always I had promised that I would write a book about her. Mm -hmm. And we were always too busy living the book. Yeah. She felt that I was being favorite, of making a favorite of Maria, and I should write her book too. And I finally have. And, and that's what this one is. That's what this one is. Dance uh -huh. around the sun. Yes. For the sun dance. Well, when I talked to you the other day, did I understand you to say something about the um, uh, mythology of the Southwest? Are you writing an article on that? No, we're writing a book on it. We're, oh. going, we're going next month to the Piedmont Papago to collect mythology. Where? <laughs> <laughs> as far southwest in Arizona as you can get, it's a horrible place to suffer. You would pick it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know, I, I, I'm dumb. <laughs> uh, but we, uh, we are going together because Carol wants photographs of that country and she has a series of Hobie photographs and a number from the Rio Grande Pueblos mm -hmm. and we have a lot of material from those. Oh, groups. that's wonderful. So um, we want to get the southern Arizona tribes which are not so well known. No, they're not. And uh, we have a friend in Scottsdale, a Mojave gentleman, who published a book at the University of Oklahoma Press, and we're going to start with him and go on from there. That's good. Well, I'd be interested in knowing that because I think these legends that we are losing, well, I think they are priceless. Some of the Indian families. Uh, maybe second and third generation from the real Indian, but the stories they tell, we just love to get them. Well, you have some awfully good storytellers here. We, well, we've done a general American Indian mythology and uh, Plains Indian mythology, yes. and now we're doing the Southwest, and they want a series of seven or eight of these mm -hmm. books, which will take time, but it's worth doing. And uh, meantime, Carol is researching like mad on the southern fur trade in the Osages stages, and uh, has finished the manuscript, the rough draft, of a book on a site that parks one. So we're not wasting our time. Seems to me like you still got more to come. <laughs> I don't, I don't think we're going to run out for a while. No, it doesn't sound like it. Uh, now I'll get back to your books. In the, of course, I'm having to leave out and skip a lot of magazine articles oh, and things that you did that I couldn't find all of them. And <laughs> <laughs> so I don't have those. But in your plan to fame and recognition, uh, Name some of the ones that were the most, that you drew the most response from. 
undoubtedly the ten grandmothers and Maria. That's what I named. They had both been out for 28 years. When I worked in the library, we had a waiting list. Uh, when the ten grandmothers and uh, Maria, you had written it several years. I don't know how many editions you'd gone through, but it was how many publications at least had gone through. But we still had a waiting list sometimes at 12 and 14 on those books. Uh, I, I really, I don't quite understand how they hang on so. 20 years, years and I've had to renew the copyright on both of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, people still write to me. Uh, I get letters from abroad. Uh, I get letters from all over this country about those books. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were wonderfully told. Thank you. Thank you very much. They, they just picked the spot some way. <laughs> Even with readers that weren't real literary lovers at all. But they love those stories. Well, they're, they're simple. They're direct. And the editor at Pearl and Company says that Dance Around the Sun is going to be uh, another Maria. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. I'm so anxious to get it. <laughs> so am I. We read the jacket copy yesterday. It's finally come. Uh, now, what tribe is this about? Cheyenne. Cheyenne. You couldn't be partial, could you? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> as long as there's something to learn, learn it. That's right. Uh, now, then, let's discuss the books. We've taken the two that have proved to be probably the favorites. But you did such prolific writings along in the old 49, late 40s and the early 50s. You put out sometimes at a two a year. Yes. Uh, Some of those were for children. Yes. Tell us a little bit about your children's stories. I gave my oh, granddaughter one. She I just think loved one that it. It's a funny thing about books for children. Uh, girls will read books about boys. Boys can couldn't care less about <laughs> books about girls. So the most popular out of the children's books has been the Blackstone Knife. Really? And uh, the one I like best myself is Indian Annie. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> tell us just a little bit about that Indian Annie. Well, that that is the story of Lillian Hunt's mother. Many Goombai, G O O M B I, whose great grandson now is director of the Indian Exposition at Anadarko. Mm -hmm. But uh, she was a girl who was a white girl who was captured in Texas by a raiding party and adopted by a, a, a husband and wife who had no children, and grew up as a Kiowa, married a Kiowa, well, I forgot all about her English, really, mm -hmm. spoke nothing to Kiowa. Mm -hmm. I knew her in the last year of her life. I was a very old lady, mm -hmm. but uh, she was a very interesting person, and uh, the story pretty well parallels uh, Fauna Parker's mother's story, Cynthia Ann Parker, who was captured in the same way. Mm -hmm. And uh, But this was her real story. This was her real story. Mm -hmm. We hear so much about Cynthia Ann, and I say don't, don't hear Roger about Minnie, no. No. Well, that had to be written. Well, it just happened. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Cow, the books wouldn't be complete without it. How came you to write Hell on Horses and Women? The American National Cowboys Association went to Savoy Lawtonville and said they wanted a woman, a writer, and a Westerner to tell the story of life on ranches today. Not the old timers, but the, 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 the <laughs> women who are still alive. 
pen and I went and I took off. We went from Florida, where they had a big cattle industry, you know, mm -hmm. uh, to Montana, across the border into Alberta. Everywhere, the grass grows practically. Mm -hmm. And uh, interviewed the women on ranches. And I must say that people couldn't have been nice. Mm -hmm. And when the book was getting ready for publication, the Cattlemen's Association had a, a national meeting in Fort Worth and they asked me to come down and read one chapter. And the chapter I had, it was right at New Year's, and the chapter I happened to pick was a Christmas story about Montana. You know, we even went up. And some people said the snow would be one way, and some people said the snow would be another way. <laughs> I said, the one who told me the story said it was like this. <coughs> and we had a free-for-all. Real Donnybrook. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell Robbie about how the snow falls right here. And in Montana. And in Montana. Mm -hmm. That was bad too. At least the Florida people. <laughs> a person can go to some of those places and spend two or three days as a tourist and think they've really researched it and know all about it. Well, I had to do it very much once over likely with that book because time ran out and money ran out and everything else. And they, they, they were putting pressure on me to, mm -hmm. to finish it. They wanted their book. Mm -hmm. Well, they were to it. So I did it. <coughs> uh, it's the only book I've ever had, with one exception, a really bad review of it. And Louis and I reviewed it for the New York Times and we haven't spoken to each other since. <laughs> well, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't mind the New York Times much anyway. <laughs> well, of course, that's where that's my opinion. <laughs> that's where every writer wants to wind up. I know. But, uh, anyhow, that was the, the sad part of that book. I take it, but I don't often read the, I don't even read the book reviews. <laughs> well, I noticed this morning in the paper that the Western Writers of America, who gave us a joint award on our priority. Yes, I want to know about that one. Well, that, oh, that, was, that, that was a lovely time. We went back up to Sheridan, saw a lot of people I worked with when I was up there, and made some new friends, and uh, they gave us the award jointly because they couldn't decide <laughs> how to be fair otherwise. So they gave it jointly? Mm -hmm. Oh, how nice. And uh, now they're meeting, I see, out at the Colorado Hall of Fame, and uh, so the Times has stopped reviewing Western material. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there seems to be some feeling about the matter. <laughs> that is, the Northeast has. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But uh, actually, you know, I think it does better. I think Western material does better in the East because it's an escape. Well, it has up until now. Mm -hmm. uh, I know there's some people that say that it's that it's um, passe now, but they say that you'll find in every home great stack of westerns. Well, it, it really is an escape. It's, it's like the Plains Indians. People think of them as the typical Indians, or by the sources and what have you. And as a matter of fact, that life lasted less than a hundred years. About, from about 1700 to 
Well, no, from 1750, say, to 1870, when my wife played out with Texas, and the Plains Indians couldn't get around anymore. That's right. And the buffalo had been killed off, and they, the whole thing just smacked back. But uh, it, it's an escape. It's a, the free man on a horse riding, you know, it, it's exciting if, if you haven't if you have tried it. Um, actually, if you try it, it, it gets back in my <laughs> 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 it, is, I, it is a thing that appeals to a great many people. Mm -hmm. And that that's another book that I saw better overseas than in this country. It did. I know so many of my foreign students, when I talk to foreign students, visitors here for the government, when they first come here, I had the first question was, where are the Indians? <laughs> oh, and I was supposed to produce them war bonnets and all, like they had seen on the screen over in uh, yeah. Lebanon or Jordan or someplace. And uh, so I had a Kiowa boy by the name of Harjo who was in my other English class out at OCU. Now I've got it. Uh, Miss Mary, it is limited in time uh, today, and for that reason we're going to make this interview in two sessions. Uh, when could we set for the second one? Next Tuesday, that's all I've Next been. Tuesday will be the second session then. Second session. And we'll that pick up right where we are on this tape. We are now at the... Uh, this is June the 29th on our second interview with Miss Alice Marriott, M-A-R-R-I-O-T-T. -T. Um, we are in her lovely home on Northwest 56th Street, and it's a very pleasant June morning. Uh, I'm going to ask Miss Marriott if she will continue with uh, her discussion of her life with the Kiowas, that she spent uh, the two, two years or two summers, which was it? Well, <laughs> it's, it's nearly 20 years now. <laughs> I've never let go, but uh, it's a continuing experience, and I feel that it should be for anyone who is making a real study of a group of people. What I had really wanted to talk about this morning, if you don't mind, is the continuing question of how do you write a book? Okay. Um, my students are always coming to me in the creative writing course we teach and saying, what's your inspiration? Well, because the only inspiration is a flat bank balance. <laughs> You're inspired, no answer by that. <laughs> and, uh, I usually have to be driven into it. But what you do actually is sell an idea, not a book. You don't write it, you sell the idea. And we work through an agent, Mr. John Meyer in New York City, who is very good and very much on his toes. Also in Europe today. And, uh, he talks to publishers and says, I have writers who specialize in writing about Indians and mythology, and uh, how do you feel about it? it? We started first with Nanine Joseph, who died of this spring, and she had marvelous connections with all publishers in New York, and we wound up with T Y Crowell, C R O W E L L, and with an editor named Hugh H U G H Rawson, R A W S O N. 
who has been very sympathetic and responsive. We have a great empathy with him and uh, have worked well together with Mr. Rawson. But the trouble was, he got sold on the idea of a series of books. <laughs> and <laughs> we're now doing a section by section volumes on mythology of the various geographical areas of the United States. Mm. Uh, a year ago, I got bored and uh, I said, look, you said all this mythology nonsense, which is getting pr pretty repetitious. So why don't we do a book about an Indian woman? And that was when Dance Around the Sun about Mary Inkinish uh -huh. was begun. Well, you sell the idea. You collect the first installment of the advance and hope it lasts till you get through with a rough draft. Mm -hmm. Then you do the finished draft, which may or may not take quite a lot of time. And uh, And then that goes to the publisher for editing. He said, uh, he questions facts and uh, dates and names and things of that sort. Mm -hmm. And he's uh, very, uh, not to mention punctuation and spelling. And he's a very busy man for a while. That comes back that to us in the form of proof. They're just finished reading the page of Sound Dance Around the Sun. And uh, it is a rather slow process for us because we're not fast workers and we insist on accuracy wherever possible. Then you collect the next installment of the advance. And about three months later, the book itself is finished and released to the public. This year, it's taken a little longer than usual because this Crowell and Company merged with Harper Road and uh, formed one great big gigantic firm. But fortunately, the team of Rockland, Ross, and Marriott continued uninterrupted. He went with the firm. And uh, we're very happy about that. Yeah. You, you can be stuck with a bad editor, and mm -hmm. that's pretty tragic. So the thing that really counts is the application of the seat of the pants to the seat of the chair for a given period of hours every day. I try to work two to three. Carol is capable of a great deal more concentration than I am and she, she's been known to go on for eight hours. But uh, usually you learn your working time, your working habits, and you get yourself set up and stick with it. The, uh, the, the public has an idea, I think, that everybody who writes books makes fortunes. Well, you can see for yourself, we don't. We do our own housework, our own gardening, our own uh, repair work when something gets broken and <laughs> oh, I said broken <laughs> and uh, it's not a luxury life if you're fortunate enough as uh, Marilyn Harris has been to hit a book of the month club award <laughs> then you're in the money for a while <laughs> but it doesn't last all the time which book was that? That was the uh, Conjurers, the second, the third book she wrote. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, it, it had not gone in the soft cover. And my surprise, I thought it was mm -hmm. because had her fox, her second book did. Mm -hmm. But uh, Mrs. Harris, like ourselves, has very regular working habits and sticks with it. Mm -hmm. The uh, I mean, grief comes usually when they reviews either come in or don't come in. <laughs> wow. And we've had some pretty awful reviews. I was working out there. I don't know how to get away from a dog anyway. But at any rate, this is not a pain but a, a big pain business by any means. Mm -hmm. You nearly always have to have another job. We teach or do museum work and um, we average around five thousand dollars a year between us on our books. Mm -hmm. That doesn't allow for a very luxurious life. <laughs> when you have to, have to travel to collect material, which we're going to do next month, and um, it's, it's just plain hard work. I try to convince my students of this, and I never believe it until they're faced with their first term papers, and then they find yeah. out I know what I'm talking about. That's right. And, uh, they have to sell me the idea before I'll let them write, the write, and write a paper. Mm -hmm. the, uh, there, there was a while when we had a run on bad men. Oh, yeah. Everybody wanted to write about the Daltons and the they're very, The outlaws are always oh, very my. interesting. Well, I'm bored to the teeth with them. And I announce at the beginning of each semester that any student who writes on outlaws is flunked mm -hmm. automatically. Mm -hmm. And uh, they sort of rear up and say, well, this is folklore. And I say, yes, but you're the folk. Write about yourselves. <laughs> and write about your families. Mm -hmm. but the lore that isn't hashed over mm -hmm. onto paper mm -hmm. and they finally get the idea and they do it but to, I, for some reason the smaller the blonder the prettier the more attractive a girl is the more she wants to write about the Daltons and the James boys and so on <laughs> and I have to uh, well, argue her out of it. Let's put it mildly. <laughs> <laughs> what are what are some of the topics? Well, we had a Greek girl, a charming girl, who wrote for her term paper a story of Indian church music in the Creek country and he used her father as an informant. He's quite skilled and very gifted and uh, that article was published in the Chronicles of Oklahoma a few years ago. I uh, have, we had Justin Wells, the painter, uh, in our class and we couldn't get rid of Justin. He just hung around and hung around. So, when he wasn't painting, he wanted to write about cowboys. And I said, well, do you have to write about Western cowboys? And he said, no, I don't have to write about Western cowboys. There were lots of them on the East Coast. So I said, write about the Eastern cowboys. And um, we have had a young man this last year who was in Vietnam and Korea and had a tough war each time 
And we got him to write about his army experiences, and he wrote it all out of his system. It was it was therapy in a way, mm -hmm. and uh, wrote very wonderful. And <laughs> also this last semester, we had a boy whose wife was Spanish, and she knew the tarot cards, T-A-R-O-T, the fortune-telling cards. Um. And uh, he got interested in the occult through her and uh, did some fascinating papers on various aspects of occultism and mm. of the tarot. And things like that we enjoy very much mm -hmm. when, when you get that, that kind of response. I had one young man, another one we couldn't get rid of. <laughs> they just come back and come back and come back. Uh, who was interested in the Salem witch trials. And he wrote vo volumes about Very good material, very well researched, very interesting. Just, just a a fine piece of work, and we were very proud of it. So we try to bring out, we've had students from Yukon and from Hera who have written about Czechoslovakian customs in those communities. Uh, we had a young nun who was a teacher at Villa Teresa who wrote a great deal about uh, the life in a convent, which is much more, much less restricted than most of us think. Mm -hmm. And she has remained our close friend. She's now in Frederick, uh, teaching down there. But every time she's in the city to visit Villa Teresa, mm -hmm. she comes or calls. Last time she called, she wouldn't come. And I said, well, Sister Margaret, you know, really, I'd love to see you. And she said, I know you would, and I'd love to see you. But the trouble is, you'd give me a hug, and I'm sunburned all over from swimming. <laughs> I can't stand to be touched. <laughs> and I said, well, how are you getting along in a black habit with sunburn? She said, I'm not. I put a white nightgown under it. <laughs> <laughs> but one thing that the Indian Council did four years ago, we had a meeting of the American Society for Ethnic History at Edmond, which we ourselves sponsored and put on. And the Indian Council cooked and served an enormous dinner of Indian foods and we put on an Indian fashion show. Oh, okay. who, who was it led in that? Well, I think it was really Carol. Carol. <laughs> She's the trigger man. It was her man. idea, probably. It was her idea. Mm -hmm. She's the trigger man.
had been to a meeting of the society a year before in Athens, Georgia, and we're bored to tears. I mean, we're fascinated by the subject, but the papers were so dull. So we thought we'd spark it up a bit. And we had the meeting in Edmond, where they had the stage in the Red Carpet Motel. No, no elegant civic center, you know, or anything like that. And uh, we had the fashion show in the dinner in the basement of the Methodist Church. And uh, we had a uh, banquet, a real official banquet, in the basement of the Cowboy Hall of Fame, which Mr. Crapo very kindly lent to us. Did the Indians attend? Some of them did. Mm -hmm. And uh, all members of the society who could get there attended. Mm -hmm. but the thing that drove me crazy with that particular celebration was the room full of fire pianos. Mm -hmm. And everybody was chugging a quarter into a player piano, you know, and it went on and on and on. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, this had nothing much to do with writing books. <laughs> well, I'm really interested in the Indians, and your, the way you have depicted them uh, shows us that you are familiar. Well, you have to be. Uh, and, and we're interesting to record as much of that as we can, because we don't have too many sources for that. Well, we ought to have Oklahoma's a should have. An oh, anthropologist right. paradise. Yes, should be. With 57 varieties, literally. 57 recognized tribes. 57? Yes, from all over the country. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's never an end of what you can do in Oklahoma in anthropology and in collecting material. Mm -hmm. The trouble is that you tend to get discouraged when you look at what you haven't done. <laughs> I, I do, at least. I would like to be able to say, for instance, that I, I have seen the ten grandmothers of the Kiowas, the medicine bundles. I've seen the outside of one which was hung in a teepee and kept by an old man who was telling me stories. Uh, the others and that one now were collected by his nieces and they are in a bank vault in Dallas and nobody's going to see them. So I have to say when it comes to the Kiowas, I've never seen the damn grandmothers. I've helped but you're a buffalo on the prairie. And that was interesting, I guess. It was very interesting, you know. They uh, they shot the buffalo on the rifle, high power rifle, peeled back the skin from the flesh, and then began taking the flesh off in layers. But there are very few white people no. who have seen that done. Mm -hmm. And when it's all finished, the meat is as clean as if it came out of the fresh grocery. It's piled into, back into the skin with the bones. And uh, in this case, it was put in a truck. In the old days, it would have been dragged by a horse and taken to the camps for distribution. Mm -hmm. uh, I have, and then each family receives a part. Each family receives a part. Mm -hmm. Communal thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. It was, this was at Fort Sill actually, and the buffalo came from the uh, wildlife reserve over west of there. But uh, you, you almost have to experience these things to know what they're like. That's what's so valuable. And um, I'm trying to think, yes, I went to the Cherokees in eastern Oklahoma, the Anikadula, 
Oh, how do you spell that now? Capital A M I, capital K I T U A H. I would have missed that one. And uh, I went for their midsummer ceremony, at the lighting of the new fire. Well, I was very new and young and sort of green, and. I began asking about beadwork, and they said, no, they didn't have any beadwork, they didn't make beadwork. Well, I should have known better, I, I, but I kept persisting about beadwork for some reason. I, I'd been in the Kiowa and Chai country, and I had it on my mind. Finally, the head priest at the ceremony took me to the grounds where the dance had been held the night before and opened a little shelter. I wasn't allowed to go in because the men's ball sticks and balls were kept there and women must not go near them except to watch the game. But he did bring it out and I don't know how I scraped my teeth off the ground exactly. A six seven beautiful wampum belts, which the Senecas, who are linguistically related to the Cherokees, they're both uh, Iroquoian-speaking tribes, had given the Cherokees oh, around 1700 as a peace treaty. And they were going to pieces. They'd been strung with sinew and wampum eventually will cut through anything and uh, he said if you're interested in beadwork sit down and mend them well I happen to have a sewing kit in, in the car and I sat down and I mended the belts as far as I know they're still there I don't know why and you knew how to do that oh yes it was, it was simple beadwork mm -hmm. and uh, where have you learned that Alice I don't know. I'm sure. <laughs> All the women I knew in Western Oklahoma did. I mean, Mrs. Ignatius was a terrific bead worker, and mm -hmm. Lillian Pond was a very fine one, and people I knew all did bead work. This came from your general association? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, they get started on something and say, here, you finish it. And you I, do it? I do it, yes. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Uh, Carol's the person you really have to talk to about craft. She's a. I'll, let, I'll get her. You get her because she, she's good. Okay. And uh, my own interest, of course, <coughs> the thing that I have most enjoyed is pottery. And uh, when I went to New Mexico and worked with Maria Martinez. She had me make a pot by the coil method. I made the pot and we fired it. And it was awful. <laughs> it was just terrible. So Maria took the pot and broke it. She said she wasn't going to have anybody know that she could teach someone to make a pot as bad as <laughs> I, I, I would have liked to keep it. <laughs> had she become so famous then? She was famous before I knew her. She, mm -hmm. Her work was in museums all over the world. Mm -hmm. and yes, Maria's been famous for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't have a piece of her pottery in this room at all in the other room. I'll have to show you later. But um, making of these coiled baskets. Those are both healthy uh -huh. and were made by my friends there and given to me for presents. And uh, you have to start in the middle and work out. They never have a pattern. 
never a design. It's all inside the head. And uh, I really think that that is the most difficult work I know. It's beautiful. It's quite aside from the fact that you have to go out and dig up yucca. And it will cut your, it cuts bones as well if you're not careful. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that is really something. But, you uh, The Hopi women on the second mesa where I worked made it specialized in these coil baskets. And uh, you find when you get to know Indian crafts that there are specialists in all departments. That uh, one village will make one kind of pottery, another a, a, a different one. Uh, Comanches make a netted beadwork that nobody else does. And uh, Kiowas do a twisted beadwork. Cheyennes do straightforward sewing of beads on skins usually. And uh, there are various kinds of techniques that it takes a lifetime to learn. Mm -hmm. And I think the... Are there patterns, um, symbolisms of their tribe? No, they're not. Like the, like the triangles up there? No, uh, that's a star, that's called a star. But it isn't a symbol, it doesn't, doesn't represent a star particularly. It, that's a name, as we call a, a yeah. mark, a diamond. And uh, this is very hard to explain sometimes because people want symbols, symbols, symbols. Yeah, well, I know what it means. <laughs> it, does, it doesn't necessarily mean anything. It's uh, sometimes, yes. Now, the iron kettle drum up there is used in a peyote ceremony. And the rope is wound around it to hold the head tight in the pattern of the morning star. And there's a great deal of symbolism in peyote itself. You wrote something on peyote, didn't you? Yes, we did. Tell us about it. I haven't read that. Well, <laughs> I can tell you that a dear good friend of mine wrote a review of it and said for the amount of book there is, this costs too much. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, both of us have taken part in peyote ceremonies and we wrote of the history and uh, part of the design. They're very selective about who they let in well, they, 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 they just closed now, completely, the white people. But uh, we were lucky, and we got in, and our friends were very, very kind and generous about it. And uh, we feel that peyote is, you can argue about it. Is it a religion or is it a cult? And now, mm -hmm. it has a sort of generalized philosophy, so I suppose you can call it a religion. At the same time, it has neither saints nor martyrs, which other religions have. Mm -hmm. And in that definition, it's a cult. Mm -hmm. Carol took that position, I took the other. We both feel that peyote taken ceremonially, uh, where you're restricted to four buttons, is a perfectly harmless sacrament. It will not poison you. You may get a color hallucination or something like that. I usually do. But, uh, what type of hallucination, Alice? Well, there's a central fire. Yes. And you see the colors in, the, or I see the colors in the fire. I see. And uh, 
Uh, so your explanation is more in colors than it is in actions or yes. Well, I'm I like it, you know. Yeah. And uh, Carol's, I mean, uh, her response is just to get very quiet, very sedate. Mm -hmm. That's the only effect. Kind of regress within mm -hmm. herself. Mm -hmm. Some people do that. And uh, it is, by definition, hallucinogenic. Uh, you expect to have some experience. Oh. And I think that is part of the reason you do. It's a kind of a psychological. It's a psychological thing. Yeah. And more than the actual peyote bean. But, button you call it. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. Well, isn't any religion psychological? Yes. You can't, you can't separate the two things. You can't separate the mind from the... From the body the, or... Uh -huh. uh, from, from the spirit of the religion. Or from the surroundings. You just can't do it. And... Um, Are the ceremonies very long lasting? You go into the TV at sundown and the fire is lighted and at midnight you are given water to drink and then it goes on well the last one we is that quiet all that time or is someone talking people are singing and praying and some of them testify just as uh, we would we would mm -hmm. and uh, most of the other people will be absolutely quiet. There's no no right to it. The only thing that people object to is the drum. A chief, you know, is a cold. Mm -hmm. And it's, well, it's like a microphone, really. The drum is mm -hmm. played very softly within the TV, but mm -hmm. it the sound enhances as it goes up. Mm -hmm. And I have known on still summer nights where a TV was put up 10 miles away by the way the sound carried. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's not something to play around with. And I think that the young people who got into LSD and that sort of thing have abused it. I have great respect for the peyote people I know and I find that they are very kind and generous and honest and honorable and that it's the abuse of the drug mm -hmm. that is dangerous, not the use. That's right. Mm -hmm. So well how long does the ceremony last? Well it lasts until 10 o'clock in the morning sometimes. <laughs> yeah. And uh, then you rest for a while and uh, the women have been cooking most of the night so that there's a feast ready around one o'clock and before that you have been fasting. And uh, the last meeting we went to was over at uh, McLeod and every man in the place, uh, about 20 of them, had a tape recorder and they recorded all the songs. And then they played all the songs. And then they played all the songs they'd recorded from other tribes. It went on and on and on all day long after dinner. <laughs> it seems strange to have the tape recorder in there, doesn't it? Well, I'm very thankful personally, the tape recorders are caught on <laughs> because it's much easier to yes. to record them of course. than by writing. I didn't, I suppose that was so secretive that they wouldn't permit it to be taped. Well, well I, nobody else would. I mean, they, they, they taped it themselves. I see. They keep it between themselves. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it was very interesting, really, because you could compare a file of music with Roll and Cheyenne and what have you, but um, it 
In other words, we wouldn't be allowed to have one of those tapes to copy. I don't think so. I wish we could. There is a recording of Paoli ceremony made by a Paola family that is in, uh, uh, it's available in the uh, ethnomusicology. Is it? Yes, I have a copy here. You do? And... Uh, Would we be permitted to, to copy it into our collection? Is it open? No, it's copyrighted, I think. Mm -hmm. We'll look and see. All right. And... Uh, it would be wonderful to have the history of it preserved. Well, the history was pretty well covered in the book. Yes. And uh, but the music, I thought. The music is, is music is really would be wonderful. It's. Uh, we'll look at it. And see. We'll, we'll take a look at it and see. And uh, if it is open, well, anyway, you could buy the record. Where could we get it? From the Society for Ecology. <coughs> okay. We'll see that. If it's if it can be bought by anybody, then it's open. It's open. And well, it just happens that my copy was sent to me to review for the mm -hmm. anthropologist. I see. But uh, it's open as far as I know. Mm -hmm. Anybody can buy it. We do not have very much on the peyote and peyote ceremony, although in interviewing um, men like. Uh, Woody Crumbo and others, they have discussed it briefly, but not very much. Well, you know, really, there isn't too much to discuss. They're very reticent about telling us what goes on and so on. Well, it is an orgy, I tell you that. Yes. It's more a meditative thing, isn't it? It's a meditative thing. Mm -hmm. I feel that... Uh, now, it really has a moral value, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Mm -hmm. Because the peyote people feel that they must justify themselves mm -hmm. by being progressive, modern, good people. Mm -hmm. And I think it has a, a genuine moral value. That's good. Mm -hmm. I, it's I think people are beginning to look on the peyote ceremony different to what they used to. That is, the white people are. I as they so. understand it better. I hope so. I, I, I wish they understood and tolerated all Indian religions. Yes, we and should. It's okay. Go ahead. Well, Carol says I can get 45 minutes conversation and then I, she's going to take over. <laughs> So, um, let me see, what else is there to say? As Indians move into the cities, and more and more of them are, they do grow more reticent. I think so. Because they're uh, surrounded by curiosity seekers mm -hmm. in many cases. And uh, they are increasingly reluctant in the cities to talk. They that's will right. talk in their own homes, but that's, that's about right. all. Mm -hmm. We've done some of our finest recordings at kitchen tables. That's <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, uh, I don't know, I think it's looking, while we're hearing a lot about roots, I think it's looking for roots. Might be. And we're learning ourselves as we go along that uh, Indians remember. They remember their families. They know their genealogies. They, Carol has worked with people who could go back to 1600 and trace their family lines. <laughs> and uh, with the Kiowa, I couldn't because they have a taboo against naming the dead, and uh, that is... They do? Oh, yes. Explain that. Well, you, you just don't speak the name of a dead person. And that's true with many Plains tribes. The, the name is forgotten. And very often words that are similar to it in sound or meaning are changed. 
Hmm. And uh, is that by way of uh, honoring them, or it, we we name things for people who are dead? Yes. But they they no. Want it's to placate the spirit. Oh, to set it free. I see. Mm -hmm. And uh, you just don't do it. <laughs> it's it's rude. As long as they're remembered, then they're not free. Well, it's. As long as they're spoken of, they're not spoken of. Mm -hmm. I could say uh, George and Lillian Hunt, for instance, speaking to Aileta, your mother and father, and she mm -hmm. knows who I mean. Mm -hmm. But but I, you wouldn't call their names. I wouldn't call their names. Oh really? And that that is breaking down now. Mm -hmm. But uh, it it's still pretty well adhered to. And uh, an owl, for instance, is the spirit of someone whose life is incomplete. And he comes back and cries outside the house at night until something is done to satisfy him. And uh, I had a series of wreckages in the kitchen, There's smashed dishes and everything else. And I noticed that on that shelf around the kitchen uh, ceiling, mm -hmm. I had an owl looking directly at every appliance in the place. So I moved, I removed the owls. <laughs> and uh, we haven't had any breakdown since. <laughs> <laughs> now, Alice. <laughs> I assure you. <laughs> uh, uh, Alice, in this um, uh, belief of the spirit going into an animal, like the owl, yes. um, what other animals is it that they are so respectful of, believing that they're... Well, the bears, of course, are taboo. Bears are the ancestors. And when Mrs. Enkinish and I went to uh, Yellowstone Park, she was just raptured. The ancestors came out to meet us at the park gate. And she wanted to shake hands with them. I said, no, Mama, no, please, roll out the window, for goodness sake. Don't get a bear in here. And uh, that night, you know how they're all over the Yellowstone, mm -hmm. anyway. We, we were in the cabin and asleep, and all hell broke loose outside. <laughs> and Mama jumped up and rushed to the window. Anise, Anise, the ancestors have come for a feast, and they sure had. They done. emptied every garbage can in the area. <laughs> and that was the ancestors? That was the ancestors. No. <laughs> Not many people look on them that way. No, not many. And although it's quite a common Asiatic belief. Is it? And it's uh, particularly with the Ainu of Japan. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not uncommon among Indian tribes. Mm -hmm. you, it, well, if you're, if you're cut out, you don't say the word bear. Mm -hmm. You use a simile. Oh, that thing that stands up and walks on its legs like a man. Hmm. And the great many... This is the second tape with Miss Alice Marriott. This is side one. Uh, we're continuing in her home, uh, June 29, 1977. Alice, I have asked you to discuss a little bit further the Indian belief in the ancestral idea and then we want to go to the uh, uh, current movement among the Indians. Well, I think I've pretty well covered the ancestral ideas and I want to leave some things for Carol to say that I know that are important. I think the women's movement is a very good movement. It brings people together from all over the country. They share ideas. They're interested in education and in young people. And uh, 
I feel that they should be encouraged in every way possible. Mm -hmm. The women I know who belong to the organization, such as Mrs. Cox, are very, very fine, yes. delightful yeah. people, mm -hmm. and uh, quite wonderful in their own way. My feeling about the American Indian movement is the absolute opposite. I think it's destructive. Well, I know it's destructive. Look at Wilmed and Me. Look at the way they wrecked the interior. Now, that's the military, the militant group. That's the militant group. Mm -hmm. uh, they went into the uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs offices in Washington, mm -hmm. for instance, they ripped out wood paneling that was magnificent, tore up fireplaces, walked off with typewriters and all kinds of office equipment, and then suddenly people like ourselves who were known to, well we don't collect, we accumulate, uh, acquire Indian artwork were being offered very rare and sometimes very old and important pieces with, on a black market, which we refuse to accept. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have opposed the Amer American Indian movement from the beginning. I'm definitely not in favor of militancy of any kind. And uh, the personal thing, I have friends who think it's just wonderful. But I don't. And uh, anything that is destructive of human life or of property mm -hmm. is not to my taste. Mm -hmm. And uh, at one time we were asked to represent the two Pawnee boys who wouldn't cut their hair. School boys. And the school required it. And the school required it. And we were, they took the case to court and we were asked to represent the Pawnees. But we refused. Simply because, not because we disliked the Pawnees, but simply because we felt that these boys were doing it as an act of rebellion mm -hmm. against their school mm -hmm. and their authority. And uh, they shouldn't be allowed to. So, Dr. Jean Welchfish, with whom Carol studied at Columbia, took the case and represented the boys, and they finally got off. But uh, she is an expert on the Pawnees, nobody could dispute that, and uh, it was better if she did it. Besides that, she lives in New York City, and she's safe. <laughs> She and, did. and we we never know from day to day what could happen if we took that up. Mm -hmm. That's true. So we haven't. Mm -hmm. And uh, a few years ago we were at uh, Rockford, Illinois lecture as part of a seminar thing that was being put on by our friend John Adair. And John and I had had a beautiful friendship lasting for 20 years or so. I'm devoted to his wife. I think he's a fine person. Now he is Indian? No, no. He's, mm -hmm. he's white. Uh, we published a book on the Navajo and Pueblo Silversmiths years ago. And uh, we literally came to the point where we were had to be separated. <laughs> and one of us taken into one room and one into another until we calmed down. <laughs> because <laughs> of course, the last time I saw that John was in Albuquerque last fall, and we made up, <laughs> kissed and made up, literally. <laughs> and uh, that's all right. He had come around by that time. Now, that was on this Indian militarism. That was the question. That was the question. And he thought he was for it. He was for it. How could he be? Well, John was kind of an emotional person. 
and he could get swept away. <laughs> I think he did. But on the other hand, I had talked to Thelio Nash right after the raid on the Bureau of Indian Affairs. He was commissioner of Indian Affairs at that time and was classmate of mine. And he was so disturbed and distressed that he talked for an hour on the telephone. <laughs> oh, my arm got tired. And uh, telling me about what damage had been done. And it, it mm -hmm. was factual information, so I, I took Philio's word for it. Mm -hmm. I knew he was there. I knew he did everything he could to stop it. Stop it. Mm -hmm. uh, I have wondered about the the Indians could could get all they need and all they want in a different way. The Indians can get anything that any other citizen of the United States can. At least that much. And more. I think so too. And uh, I, we were looking over the appropriations for Indian education the other mm -hmm. day for higher education. Yeah. They have better scholarships and better mm -hmm. service right. uh, than any other group of students that we know. And uh, the trouble is that the counselor's jobs are velvet and they get very bad counseling. Oh, no. And, uh, well, that's probably where it comes from, then. That's where it comes from. Mm -hmm. And uh, if they got capable, trained, well-educated people, mm -hmm. I think. I felt like it's their influence, maybe. It, I, it is. It is undoubtedly. Mm -hmm. I know it is at Central State yeah. and at Norman. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have not encouraged the students that they could have, mm -hmm. and they have discouraged students they shouldn't have. Oh, we That's had a student assistant, I well, admit we picked her out and enrolled her ourselves. She was, she's a woman who's in her 40s with children, husband has departed, and um, she worked worked us for six years without completing her degree. Now that is just bad counseling. Mm -hmm. And we did everything we could to counteract it. Mm -hmm. But what can you do? You, mm -hmm. you have just so much power. Mm -hmm. And I think, Mary, I'll turn this over to Carol now, if you don't mind. My voice is getting husky. Uh, thank you so much. Ms. Marriott, uh, Ms. Marriott, we appreciate this, and uh, I'm sure you've given us something that will really be of help to us. Well, I hope so. Uh, uh, Carol? Boy, you. Now, <laughs> well, I was born in New Jersey, <laughs> and uh, I, uh, 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 I went to school in Washington, D.C. Uh, I'll start with my name and all. My name is Carol Rockland, R-A-C-H-L-I-N. Then it's pronounced, it was R-O-C-K-L-I-N. I was born in New Jersey. And I went to school in Washington, D.C. I went to junior college there. And I graduated in 1940, two years after I was out of school. My mother died in the war came, World War II came. And uh, I kept house for my father for seven years. And when he remarried, I, during that seven years, I rehabilitated my own hearing. And uh, 
taught hearing rehabilitation and fitted hearing aids at Manhattan Eye, Ear, and Throat Hospital in New York City. And uh, part of that time, my brother and I shared an apartment, and I'm part of the time I had an apartment by myself. And it's my brother married. And I uh, decided that uh, I would never be a good salesman with hearing aids. And it was at the time everybody was getting degrees. And after we did all the groundwork, I knew just as much as anybody else. Uh, so I decided to go back to Columbia University and get my degree in um, psychology. I, uh, my advisor suggested I take a uh, course in anthropology, but I don't know I got better. So, uh, as it turned out at the end of the first year, I did liked it much better because Columbia at that time, the psychology department was a behaviorist, and I studied rats, and I like people. So I changed my major to anthropology. And uh, in 1952, I went to the University of Indiana Archaeological Field School, and uh, we had extra projects. And they had um, pot shows that had been impressed in the making of the pot with textiles. And that was a fossil textile, actually. And by uh, pressing some plasticine against that, I uh, got the positive. And when I returned to New York, I went to work, and I continued my studies at Columbia, and I went to work as assistant state archaeologist for the state of New Jersey. And I also became very good friends with Dr. Jonas Bird at the American Museum of Natural History. And uh, he yeah, urged me to go on with the study because we knew very little about the textile complex of uh, the, uh, the archaeological period, Middle Mississippi, and the Eastern Seaboard Barber uh, complex. So uh, I went back, I graduated from uh, Columbia in 53, and I continued doing uh, studying and doing graduate work. I uh, went back to Angel Mount in 1955 as a research fellow by the Indiana Historical Society, and I uh, analyzed a little bit, 2,000 of our species. And from that I wrote a very report. That led me to uh, I uh, was also encouraged to find out if any in the living Indians did that. So I started touring the museums. And I found out that the woodland Indians, the Sanka Fox, Kickapoos, uh, Shawnees, all did uh, principally the Sanka Fox and the uh, Kickapoos. So I went to the Saginaw Fox, uh, it's really a settlement in the team in Iowa. And I uh, learned how to make one of the bags at that time. Then I went back the next year under a grant from the American Museum of Natural History. I was there about almost two months. And I went to to the uh, North, to the Chippewa, and to the Winnebago. And then uh, the next year, I got another grant from the American Museum. Uh, small grants they were. And I came to Oklahoma. But uh, my first visit to Oklahoma 
way in 1955, and I came across the border from when I came down from Nebraska, and came across the border, and I turned on my car radio, and I heard the funniest music I had, I think I ever heard, singing, and I heard this is Indians by Indians program. And uh, I was in and out of Obama for 1955, 6, and 1957, I met out. But I really didn't know any non-Indian people in Oklahoma. I know Indians. I went from one side of the state to the other. To powwows and dancing and everything like that. And I would stay all around two months each summer. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would go back and forth and stay in the field for a few weeks. And then I would go back to my friends in Nebraska mm -hmm. and come back down here again. In 1957, I met Alice. And she was working on the uh, Osage Plains case at the time. And uh, in 1958, she came up to New York to uh, visit me. And uh, I came down here for that summer. And she suggested that I uh, see the whole year through in Oklahoma that I would have much better understanding. So uh, I said, left my apartment, and I came down and stayed with her. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've been here ever since. That's about the size of it. The uh, uh, Osage claim case refers to the land claim cases that the uh, Indians uh, to reimburse the Indians for and, their and, land. And you won it. And uh, I finally helped Alice on mm -hmm. that at the end. And um, went with her to Washington when she testified before mm -hmm. the committee. You won the case. The, well, name the case. We all say, no, name it. No, you won it. Now, he won the case. Oh yes, we won, mm -hmm. and it was one of the largest settlements right. at that time. Mm -hmm. it was something like seventy million dollars they got. Mm -hmm. It was, and that was the first winning case. And we worked on the second for a while, but then they went and got somebody else. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, and while I was in Oklahoma, I worked in Cushing and um, with an old lady by the name Mary Hill, who was her dad, and she was the niece of the woman I had worked with in Iowa. And uh, I just moved myself around the families. Mm -hmm. And uh, so since we been in Oklahoma, we had the Oklahoma Indian Council, mm -hmm. and uh, we began writing books together. Okay. And uh, mm -hmm. so that's how we got to Oklahoma. We taught together at OU, where we were associate professor, mm -hmm. for two years, two and a half years. And then uh, we taught, we were up in the Potential State. This will be our tenth year. Mm -hmm. Well, the time has gone quickly, and mm -hmm. we have been busy. Yeah. Well, uh, we uh, usually have put it back together. But uh, Alice will do her rough draft, and then I will uh, take it from there. Well, I don't like her, and then we argue until we work out the problem. And then, uh, we uh, typed the manuscript, and uh, it goes to New York, and when it comes back, then we both work on the edited manuscript to, to work out the problems that uh, appear. And then uh, it 
go back to New York again, <laughs> and uh, by the time we went to do my tracks around with the uh, various uh, page proof and all yeah. of that, Ethic. I found all the illustrated trial books together. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was a book that we're working on the uh, uh, fur traders of the law, Mississippi Valley. I'm doing the first draft, and then Alice will take it after that. Mm -hmm. Because it uh, takes more reading and research than she's able to do with her eyes right now. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people say they can see what Alice wrote and where I wrote. But when they point out what it was, it usually is the way they think. <laughs> and, uh, I think that if you uh, read Alice's books along and you read the books we wrote together, you would see there's a difference in the styles. Mm -hmm. um, uh, getting through good at uh, writing like Alice <laughs> by all these shit I ought to be. I don't know, I write the same way. <coughs> We talk to her, I like so, speak to her, mm -hmm. so it would be uh, different. That's natural. Yes. But um, that, that's how we put them all together. And we combine our research and our experiences. We well, uh, you know, quite a lot of Indians. I know. And uh, the first uh, Indian I really knew were Pawnees, and that was with them at uh, Blanche Matlock in Pawnee. And I was up there with a friend who had worked with the Pawnees 20 years before. Mm -hmm. I'd gone back to visit. And when it was an old Pawnee, and I uh, had attended Carlisle University, uh, Carlisle School for Indians in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And uh, she was a very interesting one. I also knew Dolly Moore, who was one of the keepers of the sacred bundles of the Pawnees. Mm -hmm. And I got to say quite a lot of those bundles. And she grew the sacred corn for the bundles of our fat each year. Mm -hmm. The woman I worked with in Iowa, who was named Mrs. Leaf, uh, I presume she had a first name, but nobody called her anything but Mrs. Leaf. And uh, she uh, was a real woman, and uh, she spoke no English. And I uh, really uh, had to use an interpreter, her son served as an interpreter the first visit. Mm -hmm. And then her daughter was my interpreter the second visit. And uh, she was a very good crash woman. And one day I uh, said to her, well, she asked me if I needed a crochet. And I said I needed a little, but my grandma had crochet and did it. And she was very good at crocheting. My grandmother was in her 80s then. And I said to Mrs. Leaf, would you like to see some of my grandmother's work? She said, oh, yes. So my grandmother sent her a pot holder to crochet. Mm -hmm. And Mrs. Leaf sent my grandmother the most beautiful bead of flax fur and moccasin. She had made two pair in the Chicago Natural History. Uh, bought one pair and she made my grandmother a gift. Mm -hmm. So my grandmother was be all done. And uh, Mrs. Leaf would dictate her letters to my grandmother <laughs> and sack her fax to her granddaughter who would translate them into English. And uh, then uh, write the letters to my grandmother. Mm -hmm. When my grandmother wrote back, the girl would translate back into sign and fax and read it to Mrs. Leaf. So uh, about neither of them would tell me that they wrote each other. They both kept the letters. And uh, 
to my grandmother said, Mrs. Leisha, you have to rock a lace shawl that they used to put mm -hmm. on pianos. Mm -hmm. and, and uh, when I was there, I had a big red bath towel on these bath sheets. And one night, the little boy, her grandson, fell asleep, and I covered him up with this towel I carried in the back of the car. Well, the old lady thought this was beautiful. Good she had it. So I said, yes, yeah, she could have it. And the following year, she died, and she was buried with the red towel and the black shawl. Mm -hmm. And uh, they gave me, uh, she had been working on a applique aprons for my grandmother, mm -hmm. and they gave them to me. One wasn't finished, mm -hmm. and I was going to finish it, and I said, no, I'm just going to give it to her the way. so much that she herself has accomplished much with the arts and crafts of the Indians are uh, making them as they do. Would you comment on that? Well, I haven't done too much with overall arts and crafts, not like ours. And one I uh, never collected or collected. If you are in and out of museums all the time, you really don't want to be a collector because if something's gone, you can put in the soup. And, um, but uh, I have acquired to things mostly by gifts. Mm -hmm. And um, I uh, understand pottery making and good pottery. And uh, jewelry and uh, making uh, my own uh, experience. It's been well with the ribbon applique work of the Wetland tribes and uh, with the uh, weaving. Mm -hmm. But um, for, uh, most of the time now we have been either dealing with mythology or uh, personal lives of the people and the ethnography as uh, it fits into the tribes. Um, I worked with a second fox woman in Stroud for uh, oh, three or four years. And uh, I have her life in Ross Drive now. And we hope that if this book on Alice is shown rather Thanks for on the song. Mm -hmm. uh, come out, uh, uh, come out, uh, uh, successfully, that we will be able to do another woman's book. And I just will be under my second track, but, uh, 
son married to uh, uh, Otto. The daughter came here one day. She wanted to know what the uh, Greeks did when someone died. So we said, well, you want to know that? Uh, she said, well, there was a friend of that woman, friend of his out at the house. And her mother-in-law had died. And when the son went to look at his mother uh, later, he dropped out of debt from a heart attack. And uh, they were sure that the woman wanted to uh, check them, uh, check them with her. And uh, the younger woman was sure that her husband was going to come and take her. And she was so afraid that she descended on her friend. Well, they barricaded her in her two walls in a corner and put the uh, chairs around so the spirit couldn't get there. About three, four years ago. And he said, well, you've got to feed that spirit. The uh, crooks there, they little houses over the graves where they put the food for the spirits. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, we suggested she go to St. And there's a good um, medicine in there. And we uh, had to go down and keep the spirit with her. And she did, and then she was all right. Yeah. <laughs> so, Maybe some truth in these days. What a Oh. Thank you so much, Carol. Uh, she has more immediate needs, and uh, I'm going to let her, I'm going to excuse her reluctantly. Uh, thank you so much for your interview. I uh, appreciate it. Uh, knowing that you and Alice work so closely together, it would have been incomplete without you. Thank you. And I enjoyed this very much. Thank you, Carol. This it is a bit incomplete. You, you see that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is uh, <coughs> the end of the interview with Miss Alice Marriott and Miss Carol Racklin. They're a team that uh, are most unusual. They work together beautifully, and as Carol told you, they have become more and more alike as they have worked together. <coughs> Thank you very much. This is Mary B. Roberts signing off.